Before we get started with the video, I want to give a quick shout out to an awesome new channel, People of Kagoshima. For those of you who don't know, Kagoshima is the name of Kyushu's southernmost prefecture and is the name of the capital and largest city within the prefecture itself. Although, many of you may already be well aware that Kagoshima is the ancestral home of the Shimazu family, one of the most famous and influential samurai clans that ever existed. The channel People of Kagoshima aims to showcase Kagoshima as it is today, displaying not only connections back to its samurai past, but perhaps more importantly many of the other craftspeople, artisans, artists, chefs, and business people who call the area home. This is something really cool, because a channel like this takes you out of the bigger cities like Tokyo or stereotypical Japanese views like Mount Fuji, and instead gives us a side of rural Japan not often shown, especially through highly polished videos that I extremely recommend checking out. So with that said, please go have a look and hopefully subscribe to the channel People of Kagoshima, which you can find a link to down in the description. And now, on to the video. In the last episode, in the wake of Toyotomi Hideyoshi's death, Tokugawa Ieyasu, now the strongest power in the nation, began making moves to assert his authority. Wishing to discover who would dare to stand against him, Ieyasu had begun to engage in a series of more and more questionable actions, until finally pushback came from another high-ranking samurai lord, Ishida Mitsunari. Mitsunari would desperately try to halt Ieyasu's efforts, even going so far as to attempt to assassinate him, but in the end, failing. Now, with Ieyasu poised to seize influence over the nation, Mitsunari works hard to form a powerful alliance to stop the Tokugawa before the Toyotomi are usurped. Ishida Mitsunari was not a well-liked man. As I have mentioned in the previous episode, during his time as an underling to Toyotomi Hideyoshi, he had neither garnered respect or prestige, and had often simply been considered Hideyoshi's lapdog. He never became a general of renown, and rather spent his time in pursuit of a career in bureaucracy. To this end, his interference with real military commanders had caused a growing hatred for him and the type of person he represented. A veteran leader such as Kato Kiyomasa, who had served much alongside Mitsunari, had in all likelihood come to simply regard him as a slimy, stiff politician who had mucked up military campaigns and who had never truly gotten his hands dirty on the battlefield. The simple fact that Mitsunari was opposed to Ieyasu was enough to even sway some over to the Tokugawa side, lest they stand with someone who they ultimately reviled. But while this was the case for some, others had gravitated towards the Tokugawa because they knew how strong Ieyasu was. Why dare to stand against the man who appeared as if his family was destined to dominate the country for the foreseeable future? Why not take his side, not only guaranteeing security for your family, but also perhaps prospering in the long run? But also, I feel there is something else to be said about the concept of strength during the Sengoku period. Even when a legitimate authority in name or otherwise ruled, be it once the Ashikaga or now the Toyotomi, it mattered little when a superior military force existed. The clans would all flock to who was the strongest, a stark contrast to the stoic image of samurai loyalty we are often led to believe existed. This was truly the age of might makes right. But there were also those who simply held more loyalty towards Ieyasu than ever the Toyotomi, not only because he had proved himself a leader of great merit, but also because of the shrewd diplomacy and wooing that Ieyasu had engaged in over the past couple of years. Significant families previously mentioned, like the Date, Hosokawa, and Maeda, along with many others, had all made intentions to support the Tokugawa. These were the factors that largely drew many to Ieyasu's side. Resentment towards Mitsunari, fear of the Tokugawa, and simply loyalty to Ieyasu. But if not join the Tokugawa, 
why stand against them? It's true that there were those who did wish to stand defiant and faithfully support the Toyotomi regime, but they were few. While many others were still very much on the fence, and not sure which way to go, many seeing the strength the Tokugawa side possessed, and instead choosing to sit by and weigh their options. Yet, there were powerful figures across the country who were strong enough to not fear Ieyasu, who bore no personal anger towards Mitsunari and no cause for loyalty to the Tokugawa. Three of these figures actually happened to be the remaining members of the Council of Regents, the Gotairo, the powerful figures Hideyoshi had put in place to be the intermediary heads of the nation following his death. And although, in the spring of 1599, we had witnessed the death of the prominent lord and guardian to Hideyoshi's son Hideyori, Maeda Toshiie, three of the remaining members had continually voiced their concerns regarding the actions of Ieyasu. Following Toshiie's death, we saw in the previous episode Ieyasu had moved from Fushimi to Osaka to now take up the role of Hideyori's guardian, an action that continued to cause tension. But no matter how much others scolded him, Ieyasu was now simply disregarding the council as a whole. It meant little to him besides simply his own title. He was deaf to the rising voices of the other council members who had not only called for him to step down, but even to simply explain himself. These remaining figures were Mori Teremoto, Ukita Hideie, and Uesugi Kagekatsu. And it was quickly becoming clear that these three figures would be the pillars which Mitsunari could use to build his army of opposition. But while Kagekatsu and Hideie were staunch allies of the Toyotomi and would soon prepare for an armed conflict against Ieyasu, Mori Teremoto, although questioning towards Ieyasu, was still contemplating where he actually stood. Many years ago now, he had at one point been at war with Hideyoshi when Hideyoshi was still an Oda clan general. Teremoto, although he had since become loyal to Hideyoshi, was still in the end not overly attached to the Toyotomi. Because of this, he wrestled in his own mind regarding if he should really choose to stand against Ieyasu, a path that may risk the Mori's prominent status in the West. It is even suspected that he did indeed make up his mind to support Ieyasu, but ultimately was convinced not to by one of his oldest and most trusted advisors, An Kokuji Eike. It is said that A.K. argued that Ieyasu was undoubtedly going to usurp power away from Hideyori, and that Teramoto should stand faithfully by the Toyotomi and against such a hostile action. Teramoto was won over and would resolve to side with Mitsunari. Because he commanded the largest domain of anyone loyal to the Toyotomi regime, Mitsunari was quick to name Teramoto as the commander and chief of his coalition against the Tokugawa. But, as we will come to see, this title would end up meaning little. Over the course of the year, Mitsunari would continue his efforts to garner more support for his side. This mainly took the form of rallying support all throughout the West, further and further away from Ieyasu's influence. This included significant clans like the Chosokabe and Shimazu. In fact, stories say that Shimazu Yoshihiro may have even originally planned to side with the Tokugawa as well. Indeed, like Teramoto and Yoshihiro, there were those in the West who were unsure where they should place their loyalties, with another significant figure being Kobayakawa Hideaki. Hideaki was a nephew of Hideyoshi and adopted son of the late Kobayakawa Takakage. He had been a nominal commander during the second invasion of Korea, yet it is here. He, like many others, grew to resent Mitsunari, who continually criticized him bad-mouthing him to Hideyoshi himself and even nearly causing him to be demoted. But now, Mitsunari was trying hard to persuade Hideaki to join him. Knowing that the two had become somewhat hostile towards one another, Mitsunari had arranged a deal in exchange for Hideaki's support. If Hideaki were to join Mitsunari, he would be granted the title of Kampaku, at least temporarily until Hideyori came of age who Hideaki would also be named the new guardian of. This was an amazing offer, a deal that would easily make Hideaki one of the most powerful lords in the entire country. But even then, Hideaki was still torn with what to do. 
Because of this, it is said he went to Hideyoshi's widow and asked her for advice, to which she surprisingly hinted that it would be wiser if he supported Ieyasu. Because of this, Hideaki made up his mind to support the Tokugawa, but in a final twist, he would be intercepted by Mitsunari personally, who managed to sway him over to his side once more. But although publicly, Hideaki was appearing to side with Mitsunari, it is also said that he sent a secret message to Ieyasu, still claiming loyalty to him. Whatever the case, Hideaki was balancing himself between one of the most difficult decisions ever, as he continually questioned whether he was making the right choice. Ultimately, we will come to see that his inevitable decision would impact everything. But while figures like Teramoto, Yoshihiro, and Hideaki all required some form of convincing to join Mitsunari, there were few who joined him out of respect. One of which was a well-regarded strategist out of Yamato province, a samurai by the name of Shima Sakon. Sakon had originally served the Tsutsui clan, but after the death of his lord, had joined up with the Toyotomi. It is not clear when he actually came into the service of Mitsunari, but what is known is that Sakon had turned down many requests for his service by other Toyotomi lords before Mitsunari had come to him. In the end, it would be Mitsunari who would rally Sakon to his cause. Not because Sakon was at risk of joining the Tokugawa, but rather that he himself was respected by Mitsunari, who saw it fit to offer him a generous stipend if he should agree to use his strategic prowess against the Tokugawa. It is suggested that Sakon understood that Mitsunari was not a well-liked figure and knew full well that the road ahead would be a difficult one perhaps because of this. But through Mitsunari's generous offer and stalwart demeanor, Sakon was won over. It is said that the two of them would inevitably form a bond of loyalty towards one another, as Sakon would work hard to support Mitsunari's efforts. Another significant figure who would join Mitsunari out of respect was Otani Yoshitsugu, a samurai I have unfortunately only briefly touched on in the past. Yoshitsugu had been a prominent general under Hideyoshi, as he and Mitsunari had come to work side by side on more than one occasion. Sadly, Yoshitsugu had over a decade ago contracted leprosy, possibly when working to quell a riot in Osaka. By 1599, his body had deteriorated to an immense degree, with his sight gone and very little use of his limbs. To cover his decaying flesh, he wore a white cloth just below the eyes so that others could not see his hideous deformity. Originally, he too, like many others, had planned on supporting Ieyasu. That is, until he went to visit his old friend Mitsunari at his castle of Sawayama. It was clear that Yoshitsugu firmly believed that Mitsunari could not win the conflict ahead. But after deep conversations between the two of them and Shima Sakon, who was also present, Yoshitsugu was moved by their resolve and decided to join with them, even though he figured it was suicide. I feel it is important to mention the friendship between Yoshitsugu and Mitsunari through a story that, although dates back to the Edo period, can still give us some fascinating insight. The famous story suggests that during a tea ceremony, when guests were passing around a cup, Bits of pus or mucus from Yoshitsugu's face fell into the tea, and while most present were revolted, Mitsunari is said to have disregarded it and drank the tea anyway in support of his friend. However, it should be noted that this tale has also been told with Hideyoshi replacing Mitsunari's role. Either way, Mitsunari had won the support of his old and trusted friend Yoshitsugu. Over the course of 1599 and into 1600, the factions had built up. Those in favor of Ieyasu and the might he represented formed what can be considered today to be the Eastern Army, being that Ieyasu's power base of Edo obviously sat in the East. To the West, Mitsunari had strung together a loose alliance of opposition against the hostile actions of Ieyasu, who appeared more and more like he was planning a takeover of the country. Mitsunari would form what is remembered today as the Western Army. And although there were many smaller figures I did not get into here, this is how the sides were shaping up between the forces of East and West. As you can see, all of Japan was slipping back into war, 
a conflict to decide if the Toyotomi regime would hold firm or if the Tokugawa would seize control. So, what can we learn? Following the death of Maeda Toshie, Mitsunari set about finding allies to stand against the rising power of the Tokugawa. But his path would turn out to be a difficult one as many were simply opposed to him or rather questioning and in need of convincing. Mitsunari would work hard and in the end build up a mighty coalition to stand against Ieyasu after swaying many over to his side. This would include clans such as the Mori, Uesugi, Ukita, Chosokabe, and Shimazu, as well as other prominent figures like Shima Sakon and Otani Yoshitsugu. This would be the birth of the Western Army, while opposite to them, Ieyasu and his loyalists would come to be known as the Eastern Army. In the next episode, this new devastating conflict commences as both sides begin making moves against one another. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.